It's a pleasure to be here and uh, have a chance to uh, talk with you about um, uh, the work that I and my collaborators have been doing uh, in the area of memory and memory distortion. Um, and I'm going to intersperse in this talk some of the, the difficulties that I've had uh, in engaging in this uh, line of scholarship. Um, so let's see, what do I want to tell you about? I, I, I submitted as readings uh, an autobiographical chapter that I published in the Annual Review of Psychology. The Annual Review, which is, is a magnificent journal, uh, is now devoting some of its time and attention to a sort of autobiographical essays. And if you had a chance to read uh, that, or if you didn't, uh, then uh, you know that I have uh, been for years now getting all kinds of um, communications. These days, uh, communications in email uh, at an earlier time, and it still occasionally happens, these communications uh, through snail mail. And I picked out like a couple of them to start this autobiography. Uh, so one person that I'm, I'm going to call Betty, um, sends me an email saying, Loftus, I remember you trying to, uh, I think she spelled it right, that's my mistake. I remember you trying to discredit every single victim of sexual abuse. Do not send me a reply. All I want is to hold up a mirror to you for an instant and let you see things about yourself that will have you waking up in the middle of the night screaming. And if you contact me, believe me, whore of the press, I will make you wish you had never heard of me. I will make you beg for me to shut the, she said, F, but the whole word, up. Uh, well, that came in one day. That really, that really made my morning. Um, but um, <laughs> then there was one from Alice. Uh, I call her Alice. Um, uh, she says, Dr. Loftus, I want to take a moment to thank you for your work. And then she goes uh, on to tell me some of the troubles in her family life with somebody who had developed false memories, and then goes on to say, I just had to let you know you're a clear voice in our darkness, and I hope you continue speaking out for us. So who am I? Um, uh, am I a whore, or, or am I uh, a clear voice? Well, how did I get to the point where I'm getting these kinds of communications from random strangers? Um, over the course of my career, I've developed a, a, a couple of paradigms for studying memory. And uh, for some of the psychologists uh, in the room, you will probably know about these paradigms, particularly the early um, memory paradigm uh, that we now refer to uh, as the misinformation paradigm. But maybe uh, for some of you others who are not in the field of psychology, you might not be familiar with this kind of paradigm for studying human memory. Um, but what I was doing uh, during the early years of my career and continue today uh, with this misinformation paradigm is to show people an event, uh, a simulated crime or simulated accident uh, and they just have to view this event. And later on, they're going to get some post-event information. And that post-event information often uh, contains misinformation, misleading information, something uh, that isn't quite right. And finally, then, we will test our subjects to see what it is they can remember about the event that we originally showed them. Uh, Early in my career, I started by showing people accidents, simulated accidents. And the reason I was showing accidents was only because I managed to get some funding from the United States Department of Transportation. They cared about accidents. The kinds of conclusions that I want to reach really apply to memory for all kinds of uh, episodic experiences. Uh, so, very early on, uh, I did an experiment, uh, many experiments, where we showed people a simulated accident where a car goes through an intersection that's controlled by a stop sign. And 
by asking a single leading question that suggests it was a yield sign, not a stop sign, we got lots and lots of people to believe and remember that they saw a yield sign at the intersection, not a stop sign. How do we introduce that misleading information, that misinformation that's part of the post-event uh, information? Um, one of the ways we did it in this stop sign yield sign uh, study is to ask a leading question. So it would be a question like, did another car pass the red dots and while it was there at the intersection with the yield sign? I want you to appreciate how clever this question is because you think I'm asking you uh, about whether another car passed and you're concentrating on the intersection trying to remember if another car passed and I slip in the information that it was a yield sign, it invades people kind of like a Trojan horse because they don't even detect that it's coming. And later on when we say, what, what do you remember about the accident? What did you see at the intersection uh, controlling? What, what kind of traffic sign? And many people, it depends on the conditions, will say, I saw a yield sign, not a stop sign. Um, People would sometimes question the ecological validity of this study. Um, well, these filmed accidents, it's, it's not really a, a truly stressful experience. These are undergraduates who are participating in a laboratory experiment. It's not real witnesses to a crime or accident. Maybe some kind of different result would occur. Maybe people would be more accurate, particularly if it were a highly arousing experience. And, and that's, a, that's an OK um, question, and criticism, whatever. And one of the ways that we address that criticism is to actually go out and do work with people who are experiencing things that are highly stressful, and they're doing it for a good reason. In recent years, I've teamed up with a psychiatrist who has, for example, been studying soldiers who are going to survival school. Uh, uh, we have, in the United States, a survival school option where soldiers will learn what it's like for them if they're ever captured as prisoners of war. It's an extremely stressful, arousing experience. I won't go through the whole uh, survival school uh, program, but one piece of it involves a 30-minute, very aggressive, hostile, arousing interrogation. Later on, these trained soldiers uh, are going to be questioned about their experience. And Charles Morgan, the psychiatrist who uh, has been in charge of studying these soldiers, and he's interested in things like, you know, the coping of the soldiers to this stressful experience. Well, I had a chance to talk Morgan into introducing misinformation into one of these survival school uh, studies. And so, for example, the person conducting that hostile interrogation might be the guy on the left. I'll call him the actual perpetrator. But through misinformation, we suggest it was the guy on the right. How is the misinformation introduced? Um, it, 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 actually, the way we did it in this particular study is when the survival school is over and we're questioning the soldiers about their memory, uh, we hold up a photo and say, remember the guy who did that hostile half-hour interrogation of you? Did he give you a blanket? Did he give you anything to eat? Did he let you talk to anyone else? And the soldiers are trying to answer these questions. The trick is, this is a photograph of a completely different person. And later on, we test our soldiers' ability to identify the individual who conducted that interrogation and many of them will go ahead and pick the guy on the right, the misinformation. Uh, we also planted non-existent objects into the minds of these soldiers. And so there was no telephone. Uh, there was no weapon in the interrogation room. There were no glasses on the interrogator. And Without misinformation, people rarely later on claim to have seen these objects. Not never, but rarely. 
Uh, but when we introduced misinformation that suggested those objects were there, now lots and lots of people said they saw a telephone in the interrogation room. Uh, somewhat fewer, but statistically more than controls, saw a weapon uh, or glasses on the interrogator. And so now I've summarized for you ab about 30 or more years of work on the misinformation effect. The misinformation effect is simply this. You expose people to misinformation. We talk about putting them in the misled condition, and you depress uh, their memory performance. And why I think this is important is because out there in the real world, misinformation uh, is everywhere. We get misinformation when we are interrogated by an investigator who has an agenda, a hypothesis about what happened, communicates that hypothesis, even, even inadvertently. Uh, we get misinformation when witnesses to the same event talk to one another. We can get misinformation if you turn on television or you read newspapers and you perhaps have experienced some high publicity event, and now you get other information from others who are being queried in the media or media uh, reports about an event. All of these situations provide an opportunity for new information to enter a witness's memory and cause an alteration, contamination, or even just a supplementation uh, to uh, the memory. Well. At the time that I was, uh, well, we'll start here, working on the misinformation effect, there were controversies that um, I encountered. There were controversies. Uh, so one of the, con and, and, but they were very kind of, I would call them healthy controversies. They were intellectual controversies. So for example, here's one. Say you saw an accident where the car goes through a, a stop sign, and, and say I feed you some misinformation that it was a yield sign, and now I say to you, tell me what kind of sign you remember seeing at the intersection, and you say yield sign, and you're positive, and you're gonna, confident enough you're going to testify in court about it. What happened to the stop sign that was originally in your memory? This is actually one of the most fundamental questions about the nature of human memory. Did I just cover it up with sort of a layer of garbage? If only I could peel that layer away. If, could I hypnotize the person? Could I get in there uh, and find that stop sign? Is it there to be found? Or has my intervention caused sort of some sort of destructive transformation in the underlying memory traces so that the stop sign isn't there anymore. This is a question about the permanence of our memories. And it, there was a heated debate about this uh, in the 80s. Um, a couple of people who uh, entered that debate were Michael McCloskey uh, and Maria Zaragoza. And they published this article in one of the JEPs. And basically, they said they believed that misinformation had no effect on memory whatsoever. And we, we sort of duped out the intellectual interpretation in the pages of the Journal of Experimental Psychology. Um, but it, it pretty much remained a kind of a healthy interaction. And, and so just to show how, how, I mean, healthy it was and to contrast it with what I was going to experience later, um, Michael McCloskey, even after all of this, would, would contact me when he needed a letter of recommendation for a promotion, or when he needed a letter of recommendation for some other job that he was uh, being interviewed for. Uh, and so there was a, a, enough of a trust there that this was a, a controversy and a debate, uh, but that we could be respectful uh, about it. And then uh, along came an even more bizarre kind of, of memory problem. Uh, some people were going into therapy. Uh, maybe they had depression. Maybe they had an eating disorder. They had some problem that brought them to a therapist's office. And they 
would come out of this therapy with a different problem, horrific memories of abuse that had happened to them as children. Many of them accused their fathers, their uncles, their former neighbors, their former teachers, their former dentists, their former anyone of horrific abuse that happened to them when they were children. Sometimes these memories involved being forced into satanic rituals, uh, being forced to watch animals be sacrificed, being forced into baby breeding and baby sacrifice. And sometimes individuals were prosecuted for these alleged offenses uh, or sued in civil court. And I began to be called as an expert witness to look into these cases, uh, and particularly these satanic ritual abuse cases for which high-level experts in the FBI, Federal Bureau of Investigation, had said, you know, I've investigated so many of these claims and never found any corroborating uh, evidence. So where do these bizarre memories come from? Where do they come from? And invariably, these accusers had been in psychotherapy. So what was going on in this psychotherapy? Well, sometimes imagination, guided imagination. Uh, why don't you, you don't remember anybody abusing you. You've got all the symptoms of somebody who was abused. Why don't you just close your eyes and try to imagine who might have done this to you? Or, or sometimes sexualized dream interpretation. Uh, sometimes hypnosis was used. Uh, sometimes just exposing people to false information. And out of this process, you would get these individuals having these incredibly detailed, horrific memories, sometimes for events that went over 10 years or more. And now they allegedly were repressed into the unconscious and they were brought back to life through this psychotherapy. At least that was the position of these therapists. And yet many of us thought, that false memories were perhaps being created. I mean, we knew for sure uh, that they were in some cases when people remembered things that were biologically, geographically, or psychologically impossible. Um, and at some point, I thought, I really want to st study this process. And the old misinformation paradigm, where you take somebody who's seen an event and gets a bit of misinformation that changes their memory for the details of the event, just wasn't going to quite cut it. We needed a new paradigm. And so we developed something uh, that we now call the rich false memory paradigm. So what happens here? There's no event to begin with, but we ply people with suggestive or false information, and then we test them to see what they, they can remember about the experience, either a childhood experience or something from the, more, from the more recent past. Now, this is what I wanted to do. I, I wanted to plant a complete false memory in the minds of my research subjects. But for those of you who are working on college and university uh, campuses, you, um, you know, I mean, and I, I assume this is the case in, in many other places besides the ones I'm familiar with, that the universities have human subjects committees, uh, ethics committees. So you want to do a study with human subjects, you've got to pass your proposed research by this committee and get approval. We didn't think it was very likely that our committee was going to look too favorably on a proposal that said, We're, we want to convince um, women that their fathers raped them in satanic rituals and forced them to you know, sacrifice animals. No. So we needed an analog. And of course, a lot of what psychological research is about is finding those analogs. We wanted to plant something that if it had actually happened, it would have been at least mildly traumatic. And eventually we came up with the idea, why don't we make people believe and remember when they were five or six years old, they were lost in a shopping mall. 
that they were frightened, crying, and ultimately rescued by an elderly person and reunited with the family. And that is what we did. We, through a few suggestive interviews, we planted this false memory in about a quarter of our subjects, either a complete or a partial false memory, uh, and we published uh, those findings. Well, right away, of course, the, the therapists, they got an inkling that uh, this was going to, we were going to attempt to apply this to some of them and their questionable practices. And they were quick to criticize. And the first criticisms I heard, which, you know, were not, were not too bad, went something like this. You know, getting, getting lost is so common. If you're going to talk about false memories, you know, on the same page as you're going to be talking about people who are remembering sexual abuse and rit satanic rituals, at least show us that you can plan a false memory for something that would have been more unusual, more bizarre, more upsetting, more arousing, if it had actually happened. Not, not a bad criticism, and uh, scientists, and we too rose to the occasion and conducted those rich false memory studies with more unusual events. A group <clears throat> in Tennessee planted a false memory that when you were a kid, you nearly drowned and had to be rescued by a lifeguard, succeeding with about a third of their subjects. A group in Canada planted a false memory that something as awful as being attacked by a vicious animal happened to you when you were a child. And they're getting really good because they succeeded with about half of their sample. Uh, I collaborated with an Italian collaborator, and we planted a false memory that when you were a kid, you witnessed someone being demonically possessed. And uh, a more recent study, again out of Canada, planting a false memory that when you were a teenager, you committed a crime, and it was serious enough that the police actually came to investigate. Um, when they published this paper, by the way, in Psych Science, they reported that they succeeded with 70% of their sample of ordinary uh, adults. And I will say that <clears throat> many people in the field were kind of shocked at that such a high rate of success in planning a false memory. Um, they managed to get the raw data from uh, the investigator of that committing a crime study. Uh, they felt the, you know, th there is a question of how do you, how do you decide that th this person has a false memory or not? How do you put them in one category or another? There is some bit of arbitrary or capriciousness to that decision. Um, they, but this group uh, used a more conservative coding scheme and knocked down the false memory rate in the crime study to about 30 to 35 percent. But still, I would argue it's pretty impressive if you can take adults and, and with a few suggestive interviews and interventions, convince 30 percent of them that they committed a crime as a teenager that was completely uh, made up. Um, a group just uh, last year published a mega-analysis, they call it. It's not a traditional meta-analysis. But they gathered together, and this is a group from Canada, the United States, and uh, Britain. They gathered together protocols in a number of these rich false memory studies. They analyzed them using a common coding scheme and uh, they report across these studies with 423 subjects that about 30% of those subjects developed a complete or partial false memory of whatever it is the investigator was trying to plant, and an additional uh, 23 or so percent developed a belief that this happened, <laughs> even though they didn't have what we would call the sense of recollection, a full-fledged recollection of the experience. And, and we, ha we happen to believe, many of us, that getting people to believe that something happened is often the first step down that royal road of getting a false memory. 
So these rich false memory studies, they, they do have a, a fairly strong form of suggestion involved. We're usually saying something like, we've talked to your mother, and your mother told us certain things happened to you as a child, and we want to see if, if you can remember these things. But you don't need that strong form of suggestion to get people to develop these rich false memories. We and others have devised techniques modeled after what we saw in that suggestive psychotherapy that was going on, and these techniques now have been used to successfully plant false memories in experimental subjects. Things like guided imagination or dream interpretation to get people to believe they had experiences that they didn't have, um, or hypnosis, or exposing people to other people's memories or to false information. Uh, and the kind of new high-tech way of doing things is to expose people to doctored photographs uh, where you show them, depict them doing things uh, that they never really did, but it looks like there's a photograph of it. Uh, and this, I have to say, it was the beginning of uh, outrage on the part of primarily the psychotherapists who were using these practices that we were questioning, uh, the patients, the thousands of patients who'd been persuaded and affected uh, and, it, well, but before I get into all that, all that nastiness, I want to say that uh, we've learned a lot of things about these false memories that I think are, are pretty, pretty interesting. For example, they have consequences for people. They affect, if you plan a false memory, if I plan a false memory in you, it's going to, it's likely to affect your later thoughts, your intentions, and even your behavior. We showed this in some studies, for example, where we planted false memories that you got sick eating particular foods. For some subjects, you got sick eating pickles, or you got sick eating eggs, or you got sick eating strawberry ice cream. And people don't want to eat those foods as much. You can even put the foods in front of people, and they won't eat as much of the offending food. Uh, there's one really terrific Canadian study, the first author is uh, Alan Scaboria, where he planted a false memory that you got sick eating peach yogurt, uh, and he succeeded with many of his Canadian subjects. And later on, when he gave people, a, a, like even a month later, a chance to eat foods and what they thought was a different experiment, you could weigh the, the the yogurt dishes and so on, they didn't eat as much peach yogurt. So you can, you can think of this as a, as a, you know, potentially a new dieting technique, the, the false memory diet. But uh, in any event, um, I've now summarized uh, quite a bit of work that's gone on in the last 20 years on the creation of an entirely false memories. Uh, and in the usual scientific talk that I give, I talk about recent work by my recent PhD, Stephen Frenda, who, developed, who planted false memories that you got, when you were a kid, you rescued, a, saw a cat stuck in a tree and you rescued the cat. Uh, the Canadian study where they planted false memories that you committed a crime, or the other Canadian study where you were attacked by an animal when you weren't. There's some fantastic wor work by Kim Wade and Rob Nash in Britain uh, where they planted a false memory that last week you cheated in a game that you were playing and you took money from the bank when you weren't entitled to take it. So uh, this line of work really um, evoked a lot of hostility. Uh, I got those emails, uh, a whole string of letters and emails that were as nasty as you could imagine. Uh, I had people writing to the chair of my department of my former university, the president of the university, the governor of the state in which the university 
was housed, trying to get me fired from my job. I was invited to give talks at different universities. I remember one at the University of Michigan, where they had death threats. And they had to hire uh, armed security guards to accompany me throughout the day at, my, at the time of my visit to the University of Michigan. Uh, and uh, there were also threats to various organizations that invited me to speak that they would be sued uh, if they didn't rescind the invitation. All of this going on uh, as a result of the conducting of these studies and the communication and publication and speaking out uh, about the kind of findings that I've been telling you about so far. But the worst thing, the worst thing that happened was when I read an article uh, about a re recovered memory case. Well, the article was published by a psychiatrist, and he claimed to have the new proof that repressed memories exist. I had been arguing, along with my work on false memories, there, that there wasn't really any credible scientific support for the idea that we can take years of brutalization, banish it into the unconscious, where it's walled off from the rest of mental life, and that you then can, through some process, crack open that uh, veil of repression, and out can come these pristine memories. That was the position that was being advanced. But there really wasn't any credible scientific support for it. And now, this paper gets published about Jane Doe. She's uh, um, purported to be the new proof of repressed memories, because this psychiatrist who participated in a custody battle when the little girl was five and six years old and interviewed her, where she ended up accusing her mother of sexual abuse, he would come back to her uh, years later, when she was 17, 18 years old, interview her again, and there on videotape, she didn't remember the sexual abuse. Uh, and then, oh my god, I do. So he'd captured this return of a repressed memory on videotape. He started showing these videotapes at professional meetings. People were talking about the new proof in this Jane Doe article. And I was really suspicious. It's a case history. And case histories, you know, do have a place in medicine and, and science. I mean, well, th you know, think of HM, uh, the most famous case history in the study of memory. Or think about Phineas Gage. Or, uh, you know, there are case histories that, that kind of can be valuable. Um, but there is a problem with case histories, and it is that often only one person has access to the information and gets to tell you whatever it is they want to tell you about that case history. So I wanted to find Jane Doe and this, the people involved in this article. But uh, how was I going to do that? There were nearly 300 million people in America at that time. How am I going to find the Doe family? Little me sitting in an office at the University of Washington. Uh, and one summer, I set out to find her. And I did. I did. And once I found the name, and it's a complicated process, once I found the name, then I could get into that divorce file. And one of the things I learned through this whole process is if you have a messy divorce, get your divorce file sealed so that someone like me cannot come along later, get into your divorce file, and find out all these things that maybe you don't want people to know. Well, Jane Doe, who, who was now at this point maybe around 20 years old, still believing that her mother had molested her when she was a child. The mother, by the way, had lost custody and visitation on account of these accusations, um, 
Jane Doe complained to my former university. Uh, she complained about this investigation. She, one of your faculty is looking into my life. Uh, I'm upset. Uh, and she complained. And so there I was in trouble at my own university. In fact, they came to my office with 15 minutes notice and seized my files. So when can a university come in and take the files of a faculty member or a graduate student or somebody who might have files? When can they do that? I mean, I couldn't believe this was happening. Well, I, I guess they can do that if you're accused of faking data. They can come in, get your notebooks or whatever, your, and now your disks or whatever. If you're accused of plagiarism, maybe they can come in and, and uh, seize your files. But of course, this wasn't any of that. So they seized the files. And it took them quite a while to figure out what to investigate me for. And it became an investigation of whether I had deliberately violated human subjects regulations when I went and met the falsely accused mother. Because I was interacting with a human being. Was I conducting research without having gone through the human subjects review process? That's what the committee at Washington had to think about. And it took them two years to finally decide uh, that I was not guilty of deliberately violating human subjects regulations. So I was, you know, I got my neck was out of the guillotine, but I was really mad because I had been a longtime faculty member and a loyal faculty member and a good girl and done everything I was supposed to do publish research, get grants, be a good citizen doing service, get good teaching ratings. And they had put me through one of the most miserable times of my life. And so uh, when the University of California, Irvine, came along nine months later with a job offer, <laughs> uh, a distinguished professorship, they would build me a lab, I would get hundreds of thousands of dollars for research money. Uh, I decided to move. And it wasn't an easy decision, because I had spent nearly three decades at my former university. And so the first thing I had to do, um, do you have these things in other places, garage sales? Because I was moving from a big house in, in the University of Washington to expensive, smaller, uh, place in Southern California. I had to get rid of half of my clothes, half of my books, half of my pots and pans, which I never used anyhow. Uh, and so you see photographs from uh, the garage sale that I had to get rid of some of this. I said goodbye to a beautiful house that had a view of, of Lake Washington. Uh, I said goodbye to the breakfast group that I had breakfast with every morning in the neighborhood. It consisted of an accountant, um, a, well, let's see, there was a 90-year-old Dutch sculptor. Uh, there was a, a psychotherapist. There was a neuroscientist. There were two UPS drivers, delivery men, who used to come in. It was a hodgepodge of people. Uh, but we had breakfast uh, every morning, and I moved to the University of, of California, uh, where I did find a lot of, of wonderful things, particularly a large group of scientists who cared about the intersection between psychology and law. So I had, and plus a, a number of memory scientists that, uh, uh, that I would end up collaborating with and enjoyed. Uh, that scientific um, exchange. Um, but new troubles. I wasn't there. In, oh, we published the expose. And if, if you ever felt like reading the expose, I, I'm quite proud of it. We, I don't give you the whole path to finding Jane Doe, but uh, I will, I lead, it was published in the Skeptical Inquirer. It's a very long article that they published in two parts. 
And uh, it, it became pretty clear to me that this memory was planted in the five and six year old by her biological father and stepmother as a way of getting rid of the biological mother and they succeeded with what was described to me as the sexual angle. Um, I probably wasn't at uh, Washington more than about nine months when Jane Doe sued me. She filed a lawsuit. There's the front page of that lawsuit. Uh, she sued for invasion of privacy, for defamation. She, uh, she sued for libel and slander, libel because I'd written uh, the expose, even though I didn't name her. She was still Jane Doe. It was still Mom's Town and Dad's Town, the same anonymity that had been used in the psychiatrist's article about her. Uh, she sued for slander because I spoke about this case at a scientific meeting and then some other causes of action. Uh, she also sued my co-author, uh, Mel Geyer. I uh, had co-authored this with, uh, I, I, at some point I felt I needed some legal expertise in this project and Mel was a, um, had a law degree. He was a professor at the University of Michigan. Uh, and he sued my friend, Carol Tavris, one of the most brilliant social psychologists on the planet, and a personal close friend of mine who we thanked in a footnote for her help with the article. Uh, she sued her too. She sued the magazine. She sued uh, the, the owners, the company that owned the magazine. And, uh, well, I don't know. Uh, even where to begin. There are, I mean, there are a whole lot of issues uh, with this case, issues having to do with what went on at the University of Washington when they seized my files and did the investigation, and then other issues having to do with this uh, court case. So, I mean, is this, is this human subjects research uh, that requires you to go through a human subjects review process? Um, I mean, that, you know, this is, this is a big question. And just ironically, ironically, um, there was a woman named Jennifer Burton who was getting her PhD uh, in the social welfare department at Berkeley. And one of the things that she was doing her PhD thesis on you could do a PhD thesis in this department at Berkeley, which was basically a biography of a scientist. And so Jennifer decided she would do her PhD thesis on me. And she interviewed all kinds of people. She interviewed, you know, people like you know, family members. She interviewed friends of mine. She interviewed scientific, people who were scientifically aligned with my thinking and people who were adversaries. And when she went to apply for human subjects permission to talk to all kinds of people who knew me, she was sent this replied, you know, dear Ms. Burton, thanks for submitting your project for review. Uh, your project does not meet the threshold definition of research set forth in the federal regulations. And then it goes on to say specifically research means a systematic investigation, research, uh, development, testing, and evaluation designed to develop or contribute to generalizable knowledge, uh, and so on, eventually telling her, yeah, just proceed, you don't need us. And yet I had spent two years with my neck in the guillotine being investigated for, for doing um, something far uh, less extensive uh, than this. And, and never, did I tell you that I spent $30,000 in attorney's fees? just defending myself in the University of Washington investigation. It's kind of interesting uh, that one of the commentators on the original article that the psychiatrist uh, wrote, he, he, uh, he, he published his article, and that's when I read it and got suspicious, 
but it was also accompanied by a number of commentaries. And one of those uh, um, people commenting said, it would be interesting to see how this experience has produced substantial changes in her life, meaning Jane Doe, for better or worse. Well, what happened? It is a long story. I've written a few pieces uh, about this story. But it finally ended. It went all the way through the California Supreme Court, four and a half years of litigation. Uh, and there was a finding uh, that Jane Doe had to pay $250,000, attorney's fees for many of the uh, defendants who had been dropped from the case. And so she declared bankruptcy. Now, now I thought maybe that, OK, finally is this over. Uh, with this bankruptcy filing in 2009, but it, it isn't really over. Because the last year, The Guardian discovered Jane Doe, and who, by the way, filed her lawsuit under her own name. So people know now her name is Nicole's House. And this is a huge article that The Guardian last year did on this case in which uh, Jane uh, Doe, Nicole House, uh, basically says, some days I think I was molested and others I'm not sure. Uh, and you know, it's something you can read if you ever uh, feel like it. Well, uh, these, me these memory wars are not over. Uh, just a couple years ago, I published a paper. The lead author is my uh, graduate student, Lawrence Patias and, uh, Patias and, and uh, some of our other collaborators in, in which we survey lots and lots and lots of mental health professionals and psychological researchers to find out what their beliefs are about this situation. And the, the, the bottom line of this article is there's still a big gap between what the scientists are saying is true about memory and what many uh, clinicians think is true about memory. And one of the things you can look forward to is uh, another survey has now been done uh, to us. This is a survey of, we'll call it survey of people. Um, how many people have encountered psychotherapists? This is just in the United States, uh, encountered therapists who tried to convince them that they had repressed memories of sexual abuse and how many of those people went on to develop the recollections. This will be published in clinical psych science as soon as the commentaries are, uh, are in on this paper. Uh, and it, the answer is millions and millions of people. So uh, let me see if I, I guess that. Uh, yeah, I mean, ordinarily, I would, if this were a scientific talk, I'd be taught to asking, telling you about some of the questions I usually get about false memories. I reread the abstract that I wrote uh, originally for, for this talk, and that's when I thought I was going to tell you that uh, you know, one of the questions I often get is whether, is there any way to tell the difference between true memories and false memories? Um, Maybe people are more emotional about their, their true memories and their false memories. That doesn't seem to be the case. Maybe if you did neuroimaging, you would find that neural signals are different for true memories and false memories. That doesn't seem uh, to be the case. Um, I, I would ordinarily talk about some of the ethical implications of, of this work. I mean, I, I gather over the last week and a half, when you have been talking about nudging versus boosting, that um, discussions of freedom and freedom of choice uh, enter into the conversation. Well, here we have a situation where potentially you could plant false memories and make people happier or healthier. We got them to eat less of fattening foods. We got them to drink, be less interested in drinking vodka drinks. Didn't work with me, but it, it, <laughs> it, it, it seems to have worked with some of our subjects. 
Um, we got them to want to eat more of a healthy food like asparagus. In fact, I have to say the asparagus paper that we published where we made people want to eat more asparagus, it has one of my favorite titles. It's called Asparagus, a Love Story. Um, but, so with this mind technology, obviously a lot of ethical issues arise having to do with freedom. I mean, what, should we ever affirmatively use these techniques in order to help people live a happier or healthier life? Or should we ban the use of, of these techniques. Uh, and so those are some of the issues that I, I typically would go into in, in a scientific talk. But I, I, I did want to leave time for you to ask questions. And so I'll just leave things on this question mark and open it up to anything you feel like discussing. Thank you. Thank you.